How does someone manage to be successful CEO, mom of three, and best-selling author? In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Mary Ellen Trivi. She's founder and CEO of Working Moms Only. She talks about what worked, what didn't work, and how she helped grow companies to millions of dollars. That and much more coming up now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Mary Ellen Tribby. She's CEO, mom of three, best-selling author, and much more. It's an honor to have you here. Mary Ellen is the proud founder and CEO of WorkingMomsOnly.com, which is the world's leading newsletter and website for the empowerment of the working mom. Now, when I had to read this a few times to really let it sink in, but prior to this, Mary Ellen was publisher and CEO of Early to Rise, where she helped grow the business from 8 million in sales to 26 million in sales in just 15 months. Before that, she served as president of Weiss Research, where she led the company to 67 million in sales from 11 million in just 12 months. And obviously, you're thinking at this point, which I am, is everyone wants to hire you. How do you hire you know, Mary Ellen? Well, the best way to do it is get her second book, which is Reinventing the Entrepreneur, Turning Your Dream Business into a Reality. It was released by Wiley Publishing and hit number one on Amazon in the marketing category only hours after its release. Mary Ellen, it's an honor to have you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited to talk with you today. And we just we just chatted, and this is take two because the first part of the conversation did not get recorded for some reason, and I'm just bummed. But you are just so nice about it; I can't even oh, tell no. you. Um, and you know, we're excited to hear your big lessons, mistakes you learned from your successful career, what worked, what didn't work. Um, I always like to include a fun fact. And what's a fun fact, Mary Ellen, that you just told me before, but um, that most people don't know about you? Well, what most people don't know is, one, I was a theater major in college, not a business major, not anything like that, and that I did stand-up comedy after school for quite a while. Yeah. And so how did you get into stand-up comedy? Well, it's, it's, it's funny, no pun intended, right? Um, I just, you know, I was doing a lot of theater, and so I kind of had those night hours anyway. And I started going to different um, comedy clubs, and I loved the atmosphere. I loved what was going on there, and I said, hey, I want to try this. And I did it. I tried it and, it, and I was pretty good, so I just kept going and going. And it was at the time when stand-up was becoming really big, where all the shows started coming on TV. So at the time in those clubs, we had people like Ray Romano and Jon Stewart. And these guys were just like, they. I was this young this young girl, and they would just take me around to other clubs with them. And, you know, again, it was just some people being really nice to me and helping me out there. And I really loved it. But I think, you know, I told you this, Jeremy, I think the funniest part of this is when I tell my kids this story, you know, and my son will say, Mom, I just, I can't believe you did stand up. And I'll say, why not? And he'll say, because you're not funny. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> so what do you take from your stand up days to business? Um, really, the best thing about stand up and being a theater major in general is really being able to go with the flow. And when things don't work out the way you think they're going to, that you've got a plan B. So you may walk into a business meeting, you know, whether it's with your team or a potential joint venture partner or a vendor, and things just don't happen the way you thought they were, that you have that, you know, that kind of that plan B in the back of your head. It also taught me how to keep my cool, right? Because when you've got a heckler in the audience, I don't know what, how people what, do, what that. do they want to happen? They want you to lose it. Right. And so when someone throws you a zinger, you know, at a business meeting and if it's, if it's an adversarial kind of situation, they want you to lose it. So it really taught me to keep my cool and have that plan B. Yeah. So obviously you're a very motivated person. Where does that come from? You know, what, what was your childhood like? Well, you know, my dad was by far the hardest working person I've ever met in my life, even to this day. 
And we, you know, we were not a wealthy family by any means, you know, kind of just middle class. There were four kids. My dad worked construction, right? And we had what we needed and nothing more, essentially. And I knew that if I wanted something, that was kind of what we'd say a luxury. I was going to have to buy it. So at 10 years old, I went out and I got a paper route. And at that time, you know, you weren't supposed to have a paper route until you were 12. So I said to my dad, hey, can we put it under my brother's name? And he said, sure. And, you know, when I started delivering newspapers at 10 years old at 7 o'clock in the morning, when most 10-year-olds are kind of just waking up and having some cornflakes or Cheerios or whatever, yeah. and I would go out there and growing up in New Jersey – you know, there was snow, there was cold and rain, but, you know, it was kind of like the mail. It just happened regardless. Right. It happened all the time. And that really, you know, what happened was also during that period, I saw a lot of older boys and I saw them um, kind of like having having contests with each other saying, hey, can you wanna, let's try to throw the paper underneath the car or in the bushes or on the roof. And they were trying to make it difficult for their customers to get this paper that they were being paid to deliver. And for me, I always wanted, after seeing that, I wanted to make sure that I was putting that in their mail slot, in their mailbox, the easiest way they could absolutely get it. And they, they would joke about it. They'd be like, they thought I was a sucker because I was doing the, the right thing. And I'll never forget this. I used to ask them about their tips and I would continue consistently make at least double the tips that they were making. And I was 10 years old. And that from that moment on, I knew that when you treated your customers the way they deserve to be treated, that you were going to be rewarded for that. Yeah, that's a great lesson. And um, I asked you this before, but I'm going to ask again, because obviously, you know, you find a lot with successful people. There's something that inner drive because they didn't come from maybe a lot as a parent, how do you get that inner drive and motivation for your kids? Um, you know, and that's a great question because, you know, not only did I not come from a lot, my husband did not either at all. And we have three kids and we talk to them. We talk to them a lot about this. We talk about what our childhood was like and how and they understand and they are not they're not spoiled, but they understand that they are privileged children, that they have more than most. And really, we tell them now, okay, you know, they're interested in all kinds, of, you know, my son's a quarterback, my one daughter's a tennis player, my other daughter's a softball player, and they also have very good grades. And we tell them, this is what you're supposed to be doing right now, you know, that you are supposed to be achieving these things. Mm -hmm. And if you start slacking off, and not because something just doesn't work out where you had a bad game, but you don't study or you don't practice, then this is going to go away. And they understand that. And so we keep that conversation open all the time. And, you know, awareness is the biggest thing. And they get that there are kids in this world who don't have what they have. I mean, they understand that. Yeah. So do they get their competitive nature from you? Oh, yeah. And my <laughs> husband. My husband played college, college football. So oh, really? Yes. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So You guys are a powerhouse. Awesome. Yeah, they absolutely do. Oh, wow. And so we're all, even like after dinner, you know, if we're playing a board game or cards, it's it's just as it's bad. As it's, yeah. <laughs> a family <laughs> board game. Yeah. That's how our family is too. You yeah. you don't get out without scratches. Um, right, right. So Marilyn, how did you become a powerhouse CEO? Where did that journey start? Well, it really started in New York City. Um, like I said, I was a theater major in college, and but I really wanted to direct movies. And this was the one thing that kind of got me got me really upset. I remember I applied to Columbia um, for as a part time student, and back there, you know, for film, they wouldn't accept you as a part time student. And I thought, hmm. wow, this is terrible. Here I am. I, I need to. I certainly have the grades. I, you know, I'm willing to. I'm going to pay for this, but they wouldn't accept me as part time. And so I thought, you know what? Let me find another way to learn about this. And so a friend of mine had a friend working at PBS. And so I said, you know, I just want to get a job at PBS. I'll start at the bottom and just, I really want to get into the production aspect. Well, the position I got was actually in marketing. And before that, I never even heard about marketing. And not only did I really like it, I was kind of good at it right from the start. 
And so it just kind of snowballed from there. So I was, you know, I was doing really well in this marketing department, absorbing everything I could, you know, thinking, wow, I'm getting paid to learn this. And this is fantastic. And, you know, after doing theater and stand up, I'm actually making a little bit of money here. And from there, I got recruited to Times Mirror Magazines, which, you know, even now, certainly then it was the second largest publishing company in the world. And even now it's probably still up there next to, you know, Time, Time Warner. And so I got recruited there and I really just started learning all these different channels of marketing, which I talk about in my first book, Changing the Channel. And so everything, you know, from direct mail and, you know, print and radio and TV and every different channel you could imagine. And I loved it. And from there, I got recruited to um, to Crane's New York business. And so, and that was a fantastic position. And from there, I got recruited to, um, no, from, from Times Square, I went to Forbes. And that was a great experience because, again, that was a wonderful experience because I was working directly with Steve Forbes. Oh, wow. And he, w- you know, he was very cool. And he would ask me about results all the time. And it was very nice. And then from there, I got recruited from Crane's New York business. So and when you were working there, with Steve, real quick, back up for a second. When you were working with Steve yeah. Forbes, what were some of the, was there a campaign that sticks out during that time that, that you uh, still think back on? Well, I do because the funny thing, he wasn't, he wasn't my direct supervisor. You know, I was a marketing director, a publisher was my direct supervisor, but I guess one day he was looking at reports and it was funny because he called me directly and said, hey, would you come down to my office? And I came down there and this was, you know, on Fifth Avenue, beautiful office building. He's sitting behind this gorgeous mahogany desk and he's eating his macaroni and cheese. I'll never forget this at his (laughs) desk. And, and, you know, and he pulls down the reports and he said, hey, will you explain this? I've never seen results like this. Wow. You know, and so we just went through it and it was really, and from that day on, it was always, you know, he just always treated me like a colleague. And that's really, I think, another reason that I tend to get along with people because even though it was Steve Forbes, you know, I would treat him the same way I treated the mailroom guys that I played softball with at Central Park that night. You know what I mean? So I always treated everyone with respect. And that's, you know, that kind of came from Steve as well. Like I saw him, regardless what your position was, treating people with respect. And I loved that. And that's really what I tried to emulate from that day, from that time as well. Yeah. I mean, even, yeah, obviously he's seen a lot of reports. So something stuck out. What was it that you did within that campaign that helped create those results? Well, with direct response marketing, you know, there are three things that, you know, are going to factor into every single campaign, right? The list or the media you go to, your copy and your offer. And what most people focus on are the copy and the offer. But in reality, the thing that's going to make the biggest difference in every single direct marketing campaign are the list or the media, who Mm -hmm. you go to. And because I did that and because I was kind of this, I was a voracious learner and a detective and I wanted to scout out these lists that we've never used before Mm. because I was able to go out there and break into another universe. Steve, like, you know, he's, 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 you know, he, nothing gets by him. He's like, wow, I've never, I haven't seen these kind of response rates. So this was in direct mail, you know, year, gosh, a very long time ago. Yeah, I saw an interview that you did actually, and you demonstrated that point, which I thought was profound. About you asked, um, it was with Joel Polish, and uh-huh. uh, and you asked him, "Would you buy this?" Or it was a woman's yes. product. He's like, "No," and you're like, "Exactly," because you're right. not the right profile. Right, and that's kind of what I say. You don't, you know, you don't sell lingerie to lumberjacks. Right. Right. Yeah. So you can have great copy. But if it goes to the wrong people, you're not going to get any results. You can have mediocre copy going to the right audience and you're going to get results. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So I want to hear about, so you know, some of the things that created the most growth um, because obviously it was tremendous with what you did with Early to Rise and Weiss Research and then with Working Moms Only and then some of the lessons or mistakes you made. Um, start with, with Weiss Research. What, were, what do you think, um, what were some of the key factors that attributed uh, the growth to? Oh, I know, again, I know what that was. It was really the direct response marketing. You know, it was kind of the same story where for a very long time, Weiss had a great copywriter, Clayton Makepeace, and at that time it was still all mail, you know, direct mail, and they couldn't mail more than 10,000 pieces a month. 
And when I came in, we went from 10,000 pieces a month to 100,000 pieces wow. a month to a million pieces a month to 3 million pieces a month. And it was because of the list aspect, but really understanding direct mail and also understanding that you've got to ride the wave, right? Money loves speed. So when you're when something's working, you keep going, you keep going. And you know, the kind of the same thing within changing the channel, I really talk about direct response fundamentals and how you test versus roll out. And they never had anyone there at Weiss that was able to, to roll out, to really not not even just roll out, but really test all these different kinds of lists and then roll with them and roll hard. And so there's a rule when you roll out in any media that you can test something and you never go five times more, right? And so a lot of times people will make the mistake, something will work and then they'll take, you know, they'll go from five times to a hundred times more. And you can't do that with an individual list. You've got to go five times and do it incrementally like that. So with Weiss, I mean, um, can you talk about, uh, I don't know if you can talk about it or not, but what was a campaign that you think of that, like, so maybe if it's a small business or a business now can kind of see, um, what that what that product looked like or what that uh, campaign looked like sure well at the time that with weiss it was for our a financial newsletter called safe money report right which was martin weiss's report and i and i do actually remember this because we that file size went from something about fifteen thousand paid to over a hundred thousand paid newsletters right. front end at an average unit of sale of a hundred fifty five dollars Right, because wow. now people are trying to sell you things for seven dollars, you know, not you know, nineteen dollars. But but that was the average unit of sale then. Wow. And then what we did is we went into immediate an immediate upsell for an option service, which of course was five thousand dollars. And so we were bringing these people in at one hundred fifty five and upselling them t at ten percent to a five thousand dollar service. Wow. So again, it was, you know, it's kind of mapping it out. A lot, a lot of times the mistakes entrepreneurs make are they're so excited to get that first sale, they forget about that customer and they keep going after other customers for their first sale. But really what you should be doing is you've got someone who loves you right now, right? And when's the best time to, to talk to somebody about buying something else from you is right in the beginning when they love you. And people forget about that part and they keep trying to get new customers in. Now you need to have a customer path. You need to understand what their path is going to be like. And that's the biggest mistake I see a lot of entrepreneurs making that they don't have a path. They just throw something out there and now because it's the back end sales that are, that's going to be profitable. You know, we talked before about revenue numbers, about going from 11 million to 67 yeah. or 8 or 8 million to 26 million. But the bottom, what we don't have in there is the fact that profitability jumped, right? Because you don't put gross numbers in the bank. Right. You put profit in the bank. And so, you know, at Early to Rise, it had always been a flat business. And we went from a flat business, you know, to, you know, a 30% profit margin. And that's the number wow. that I'm really proud of. Yeah. So what worked really well at Early to Rise? Well, the first thing was, um, for me, was changing the corporate culture. Okay. When I went to Early to Rise, there was probably 12 people at the time and I went in and I fired eight. And it's not because um, I like firing people because I don't, but I believe that if you don't have people who love their customers, the business is never going to grow. Yeah. If you don't have people who respect each other as colleagues, the business is never going to, is going to grow. And so, and then I built it up from there and had a corporate culture hmm. that everybody brought, bought into. Yeah. I mean... And, Go ahead. And then the same thing where they were primarily in one channel of marketing. It was all, you know, online marketing at that point. So we started telemarketing. We started direct mail. We started print ads. Because if something's working in, you know, online, why aren't you going to go in the mail with it, right? Why aren't you going to go and print ads? That may, and again, because my thing that I do, you know, better than most people is find that media. So yeah, you're telling me this is working in, you know, online right now. Well, I can find print media where that's going to work. So yeah. again, by so you've got the same campaign, the same copy, the same offer, but just going out there and getting more media, more eyeballs because the bottom line is even though we're such an online culture, a lot of people still like that hard copy. Yeah. A lot of people still want to talk to you. A lot of people see it on TV. So it was really going into multiple channels. Yeah and keeping the con um, congruency 
you know, keeping the campaign so that people weren't confused. And that's a, another mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs do. They have an online campaign that works. Now they want to go in direct mail and they put something totally different out in the mail. Well, you go in the mail with what's working online, mm -hmm. then you test against it. Yeah. So I think it's interesting what you said when you came in, you kind of cleaned up the team and obviously you recognize this pretty quickly. What were some of those key things? Because there are people there and they some of those people probably worked there for a while and yes. no one really thought to do that. What were some of those key traits that you really zoned in on that you knew I need to clean this up? Um, when I got there, I was asking some members about a campaign and this one um, young younger girl said, oh, this campaign did great. And I said, um, well, tell me what were the response rates? How, you know, tell me, you know, quantify it. Quantify this did really great. And she goes, oh, we didn't really track it. So, and I'm like, why not? Oh, we don't need to. It went really well. And it would have been one thing if she said we didn't track it because we don't know how. But she said we didn't track it because we don't need to. So that mentality had to go. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm more than willing to teach any young, smart, you know, kid that's really hungry to learn. But when you say, oh, we don't need to, that's, you know. That's not that's not fixable. Right. Especially with direct marketing. I mean that's right. that's the whole right. point, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. You put it out and you want to see an exact response. Right. Right. And then it was just, you know, it was kind of like what I called that, you know, that um four fifty nine club. You know, kind of like the folks who are who are getting ready to leave at four thirty and they're talking and, and it wasn't even that because I like people having a life. And trust me, that's about reinventing the entrepreneur. It's all about having a life. Yeah. But I love people who are ready to go in the morning, not people who are kind of meandering in and then they're gonna have coffee, then they're gonna talk. You know, people who are ready to go, who are excited about what they do. Yeah. And then the other people were people who would actually talk about our customers and say, Oh, this person doesn't you know, you know, I that, that that's a no-go for me. It's a non-negotiable. When you badmouth your customers, no, it's it's not the right culture. Yeah, yeah. So any other major um, things that led to that that huge growth and profitability in, in early rise? Because I want you to I want to hear about working moms only too. Sure. Well, there, yes. I mean, again, we ha finally, you know, we had a great a great um, promotion that came our way, and you know. And we rode that wave. It was a great promotion. And that one year, that single promotion brought in $17 million, wow. which in the 35 years of Agora was the most successful campaign at the time. Only one campaign has beaten that now. And I've been, at, I've been gone for four years. Can you um, uh, talk about the campaign or is that top secret? Oh, at the time, it was the Forex campaign. It was called the Insider's Code. Okay. And so it just did fantastic, but it was riding that wave. It was looking at the list every single day. And that's what a lot of people do too. They think, oh, I'll look at the, I'll look at the results later. When something's working that well, you look at them all the time. And we would regroup on this, you know, three times a day in the morning and at noon and right before we left. And we would look and we would say, okay, look at this list. Oh my gosh. Okay. How many more names do they have? Let's get, you know, let's call right. them now. You know, even if it's, if it's, you know, five after five, call that list broker now. You know, so it's riding that wave when yeah. something is working, you have to, you yeah. have to keep going with it. It's so yeah. important. I mean, you can only ride the wave though, if you have the systems in place. So yes. what should people have in place? Cause you obviously had in place and you were able to turn it on. Oh, yes. What should someone have in place? So when that opportunity comes, they can ride that wave. Well, and that was the other thing that you have to have a well-defined team. I mean, I do a lot of consulting for companies, you know, that range from a million dollars to, you know, to $500 million. And this, if they don't have the right, not just the right number of people, the people doing the right jobs, right? The right, having the right positions when you have to have that in place. And that was what I was all, I've always been really good at is building those teams and putting them in the right, you know, silos, if you will. And then every single person who has that kind of position has SOPs, standard operating procedures mm -hmm. for every single repeatable task. Mm -hmm. And again, you can ride the wave when you know that setting up an email is going to take you exactly 20 minutes every single time because you have an SOP. But if you don't have the SOP and today it takes you 20 minutes, but tomorrow you forget something and it takes you 40 minutes, that's 20 minutes that you never get back. Yeah. Right. And I've always looked at time as the most valuable asset in business because yeah. you never get it back. And when you waste it, it's gone for good. Right. It's gone yeah. for good. 
You know, money you can get back. You can't get back time, yeah. right? And so when everybody knows exactly what they're responsible for, then things ha then you can ride the waves. But you're absolutely right. You can't ride those waves until everybody's very clear on what they're responsible for and take ownership of it. Yeah. It's the boring stuff we don't want to do, but that it, needs know, to be I done. Say it's, it's all the sexy, non-sexy stuff, right? Because, because non-sexy equals money. You know, it's all these people who come up with like an idea here, an idea there, and then nothing comes to fruition because there's nothing, there's no way to make it happen. Yeah. So, you know, to me, I'd rather be um, dull and rich than exciting and broke. You know what I mean? <laughs> and this is probably in a lot of, you know, reinventing the entrepreneur, but, but I mean, it sounds like you went in, you need a core team, you need to set the tasks so people know exactly what they're yep. doing. And then you have, you know, the copywriting, marketing, and then most specifically yep. what that, that key is the, the list that's targeted to what you want. Right. And you really need to break out positions. You know, I like to say some positions make the cash register ring and some positions support that. Mm -hmm. So when you have people who know how to make the cash register ring, you don't give them you know, um, tasks to take them away from that. Yeah. Yeah. So now tell me what brought you to working moms only. Well, oh gosh, I was at early to rise and it was, I mean, trust me, I loved it. I loved Agora. I loved my team. I loved working with Michael Masterson. You know, I mean, gosh, I mean, he and I co-authored changing the channel. It was just, it was great. And then what happened was I actually, I'll make this a short story. I actually had a breast cancer scare. Oh, and 2000, the end of 2009. And at the time, my kids were, you know, 10, 8, and 4. And I just thought, oh my gosh. And for 21 days, my husband and I kind of just kept it to ourselves and we went through everything. And it was really a really challenging time. And then we got the great news that everything was mm. absolutely fine. But then I woke up the next really morning. Scary. I, yes. But I woke up the next morning and I said, you know what? I know the group of people I need to serve. I know the group of people who can really benefit from my help the most. Because I had actually um, bought the URL, Working Moms Only, two years prior. And because I always said, someday I need to start this for working moms. I need to do this. I need to do this. Mm -hmm. And so that very day, I went in and resigned to oh. um, Mike Masterson. And it's so funny because for the first time in my life, it wasn't like, come on, stay here. Here's more money. Here's more money. He actually said, well, it's about time. And then he said, um, let Agora be your business partner. Let Agora, That's you know, amazing. and I said, no, I want to do this the way we teach people at Early to Rise how to do this. And then he said, okay, let me privately be your business partner. And I said, no. And then, you know, so. So why do you say no in that situation? Because I really wanted to do it um, on, on, on my own. I just really wanted to do it, and it's funny because when Michael talks about that now, he he thinks he, you know he always says on stage, you know, she said no, so that now when she, you know when she goes to sell it, we'll pay a lot more money for it. Um, but <laughs> that wasn't is that wasn't it at all. It Brilliant. was really that I just wanted to do this, and I had a I had a very clear vision of what this was. Yeah. And I and I just wanted to go for it, and you know, and as it, I'm so glad I did because when I talk about this and reinventing the entrepreneur. You know, you can start this as a solopreneur. You can start this, and you can make it as big as you want because it's the exact same business model that I used at Weiss when I started. You know, I started Money and Markets at Weiss in 2001, still going strong today with 600,000 subscribers. You know, I revamped Early Prize. Yeah. It's the exact same business model, and they probably have about 900,000 subscribers. So it's the exact, so you can make it whatever you want to make it into. So, what works well? Uh, what's worked well for you at Working Moms Only and what, what lessons or mistakes even after going through the other things or maybe it's, it's gone perfectly? No, I mean nothing, nothing is perfect, trust me, but really what I love about Working Moms Only is we have, what I hate in business are arbitrary numbers. And you have a lot of people who say, oh, I want to build a $20 million company just because they think it's cool. And again, cool doesn't cut it in business. You know, that's that's not a good reason to build a twenty million dollar business because, again, like we said, there's a real difference between revenue and profit, right? So if you have a twenty million dollar business, you know, you can end up with a flat line at the end of the day. You know, having a three, four, five million dollar business and ending up with a nice, you know, thirty, forty, fifty percent profit margin 
is a heck of a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so really what I learned is that I don't need, you know, I don't need that empire of, you know, because, you know, at Weiss I had over 100 people. At Early to Rise I had over 30 people. Mm -hmm. A lot of the companies that I consult with now, you know, have 30, 40, 50, you know, people. So um, you don't need that, you know, because really what happened, what I learned, it's about lifestyle. I'd much rather have that higher profit margin, bring more money home yeah. and have less people to manage. Mm -hmm. You know, I always like to use, I like to use the metric of a million dollars per employee. Now that's on a, that's on a gross revenue, right? So if you have, so if you have, so if somebody says to you, I just want to build a $20 million business. Well, chances are they're not going to have a million dollar per employee. That's a great number. They're going to have anywhere between two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollar per employee. So they've got at least forty to fifty employees, and for forty to fifty employees, that headache to bring home a million bucks, right? Not worth it. <laughs> yes. Um, so, what has worked really well for working moms only? I mean, there are certain um, topics or campaigns or yes, um, you know what's info. Worth really well is the understanding that we've always been there to build a community right it's never been about let's build a huge list it's yeah. always been about building community it's always been about you know giving them over delivering on what we've promised you know in we were up to i think we're on our 430 issue right of working moms only working moms only comes out every monday and every thursday wow. we have never missed an issue not once Okay, we said it was going to come out every Monday, Thursday. We've delivered on that every single time. And a lot of times, again, entrepreneurs are like, oh, I don't feel like doing it today. It's my company. I don't have to do it. Right? And that's just the wrong attitude. We yeah. promised this. We've delivered on it. Okay? We've never, ever sent them a promotion where they have not been introduced to that product in person first through giving our subscribers, our community, valuable a valuable content right so I don't just promote product so when you come in like if you want you if you want me to promote your product for working moms only first I'm gonna vet that product make sure it's everything it says it's going to be then that person needs to give my community valuable advice that that's useful and actionable yeah. then we'll promote it and because of that the response rates are so much higher than what you see online now where people are shooting out promotions yeah, yeah. We've always had that content marketing in play, always. So, how do you, um, I guess, attract people to the site? Do you use? Do you still use direct um, mail offline marketing, or is it more online? It's mostly online. We do so, do some off mar offline marketing, print those kind those kind of things. Um, but we, yeah, I mean, we have this community that is just so responsive that our fall off is barely anything. So the, that's, that's the beautiful part that I'm not always yeah. looking to replace that we're yeah. just growing instead. Yeah. And so right now it's mostly online. I'd like to do some direct mail campaigns this year. We're also working on doing a, more of an event, you know, this year. Yeah. So through event marketing, we do, you know, we don't do a lot of JVs because again, I don't, I don't want to owe anybody anything. You, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So, what um, what's been a proud moment? You've had a lot of successes in your career. What's been an especially proud moment for you? I think one of the proudest is when I wrote "Changing the Channel." Um, I was in the I was in Barnes and Noble. I take my kids to the bookstore a lot. We're in Barnes and Noble, and I was showing them the book, and it was face you know facing out there. And my son took the book off, and he went up to the and he's. It's always your the, son, by the way. Who, well, he's thirteen uh, now. Oh, okay. So at the time, he was about. Eight, eight, maybe seven and a half, eight. So he took the book off the shelf and he went up to the guy that worked behind the counter and said, "My mom wrote this book." That's great. Yeah, so that was that was pretty great. And now my kids have seen me speak, and you know, and that's that's nice. And there, that it, I think that really surprised them the first time. The the reception that I that I received, you know, the kind of after speaking, like, I think that kind of blew them away. And my son, he's very funny. He's like, Mom, are you famous? Like, you know, it's, it's just it's very funny, you know, so does that make them put their dishes away faster or anything that uh, they see you get a standing ovation with this huge crowd? Or? No, no, not at all. But no. I will tell you that again, it's another son story. But he was supposed to do a, um, a couple years ago as a homework product, do a commercial come up with a product, 
and do a commercial for it. And he brought in his big board and he was the only kid who had like a URL and, you know, and he, and he said, call 1-800, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, he was the only That's kid great. that did that. And also, I'll, I will tell you this, that a long time ago when my daughter was, um, she was seven, now she's 15 now, but when she was seven, she was asked to write a story about the best day of her life. And she actually wrote oh, wow. a story about the day her little sister was born. So she's seven years older than her little sister. And I, of course, my husband and I told her how wonderful the story was. And then the weekend after, we were having like a barbecue around the house. And I look out by the pool and I see my daughter going around and she's got a yellow, you know, legal pad and a pencil and she's going to each person. And so I said, Michaela, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, I'm collecting everyone's email address so I can send them my story. <laughs> <laughs> you know you've done your job. <laughs> yeah, so that was kind of you know that was kind of fun too. I so. love that. What now with reinventing the entrepreneur? I want to know what's one of your favorite stories from from the book. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Let's see. You know, I share my my um, breast cancer scare in the beginning of the book, which actually started. But I'm trying to think of a story in there. A lot of it is very, or it could be a lesson. Well. A lot of it in there is the consistency, and I think I think one of the fav my favorite story actually is is this is there's a old there's a book an old old book out there, and I forget the name that it used to be called, and it and it sold like nothing. It was a book that was published I think by McGraw Hill, and it sold like virtually no no copies. And then one day a marketer was in like a secondhand bookstore, and he's going through the book. And he's looking at it, and the content in the book was fantastic, right? Fantastic. And it was actually kind of a book about romance and men and women. And he, he loved the content. He looked at the, the name of the book, and it was something about astrological logic, right? And he's like, oh. So he actually took the book. He got in touch with the author. He took that book, and he renamed it sent it out there and then published it under how to please every woman every time, something like that. And then it sold 5 million copies, <laughs> same exact content. Okay. So the moral of the story is there is that names matter yeah. and that, um, that people don't put enough, you know, think about it enough. Yeah. I remember when I started working moms only, um, I got invited to a lunch with, with my friend, Joe Polish, um, with Richard Branson and there was about 10 of us around the table and we were all going to have the opportunity to ask him a question about business and I was just about to launch Working Moms Only and I, my, and everybody's asking these very complex questions and then I, I simply said you know, to him when it was my turn, you know, what do you think about this name as, you know, as a website, as, as a newsletter and he said, I love it, right? But to me, that, that validation, like that was one of the most important things that I could you know, use my time and ask him yeah. and, you know, and when I, and people remember it, you know, people remember working moms you sure. know, and so, and because it's easy, it's to the point, right? And I, it and, says and so, what it is. Yeah. And in the book, I talk about how you, you know, what's the right number of words within a URL, right? What's too long? What's yeah. the difference between the URL and the tagline? You know, all those kind of things. And so that's in there in the book. Yeah. So I know we're um, coming to the end. I want to respect your time. There's a couple of things I want to know. One, some of your mentors who you've learned from. You, you've mentioned a few, but um, who are some of your mentors? Well, again, back in my, you know, my New York day, the biggest mentor I had when I was a kid was Dick Benson. And Dick Benson is pretty much the father of direct mail. And he since has passed away. But this was actually, this is, I think, a, a good story as well which is I was, at, I was at PBS and Dick Benson was doing a seminar and I asked if I could go to the seminar and they had gotten a new HR person and so they declined it because they didn't want to spend the money. So I spent my money, right? And at the time at PBS, I wasn't making a lot of money, right? I spent, and I think it was maybe $500, this is, you know, in 1986, 87, um, $500 and I paid for that seminar. I went and a couple of weeks later, I implemented something that they had, Gone, he had gone over at the seminar, and from that thing, you know, at the time I was probably making about twenty-four thousand dollars. I got a ten thousand dollar raise in promotion. Wow. 
because I knew, like I had read everything, but I know that some, like you can only, you can read, but sometimes you've got to get in front of them and ask questions, yeah. in, you know, in their face. And it was much harder then because now we have all these, this wonderful technology to do that, you yeah. know? And so, so, um, by, so Dick Benson, for sure. I had another fabulous uh, mentor, Jeff McDonald, when I came to Florida and he was just wonderful. And, you know, but of course I'd, I'd have to say Michael Masterson, um, Mark Ford, right, the same, the same person, um, is by far the person who had a huge influence over my career and the, and the way I think. You know I, I, you know, I learned a lot of direct response marketing from people like Clayton Makepeace and, you know, working with him for seven years, him being my copywriter and, you know, Martin Weiss. But Mark really changed the way I think. Yeah, yeah. I have one last question. Before I ask it, Mary Ellen, I want to thank you so much for your time. You're just so gracious and so nice um, with all the, the glitches. And um, I also want you to just talk about what you're most excited about now, what you're working on with Working Moms Only and the book. Can you tell people where to find it and, and what oh, they sure, should look sure, out sure. for? Sure. Well, the book, you know, I have a site which is called uh, MaryellenTribby.com, which is a new site. It's only been up for a couple months, and that's really more of my speaking, consulting kind of site. So you can go there to get the book. And also, there's a great, great free report right on that site as well. So that's fantastic. Um, you know, working right now, I actually have some nice new clients that have come aboard it because I love, I love, love, love consulting because it puts you in so many different niches and so many different, you get to meet so many different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And I love to go in there and kind of re-engineer those companies. Yeah. But I so think- So people what, watching, what kind of companies do you re-engineer if they see you and they want to get in touch? Oh my gosh, everything. I have worked with funeral home directors. Hmm to, you know, a, a lot of information publishers to, you know, I've consulted with some of the, like, the biggest gurus, you know, in the online, you know, marketing world, you know, um, but a lot, you know, every, anything, anything from kind of, you know, um, you know, mom and shop, mom and pop shops to, like I said, large companies, you know, mm -hmm. Gore is a, is a great client right now, which is fabulous. And so, and yeah, that's kind of one of the things that I'm pretty excited about. They want to do a, a publish me in a, you know, a newsletter for me, you know, out there right now. And that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And it really is growing, working moms only continue to grow the community. We're global. We're in, you know, we're in so many different countries now. I'd like to get that reach, you know, really out there, even into more companies yeah. because, you know, working moms really are the people who set the tone in a household. For sure. And if working mom, you know, is not happy, then those kids are not happy. Yeah. And if, you know, but if she's happy and thriving, those kids are happy and thriving. Yeah. So it really is a way of giving back. Yeah. I mean, you have an amazing, just if you look at the working, you know, the working moms only.com page and you see the meet the experts, I mean, you have tremendous people as yeah. experts in addition to you, obviously, but tremendous people as experts on there. Yes. I mean, and that's, and that's, you know, one of the other things that I've learned in business is that when you're really out there deliberately helping people without expecting anything back, it really comes back to you tenfold. Yeah. And really the, the last question I have is I wanted to find out, you know, obviously you do a million things. You probably get this question all the time, which what's a typical day like? How do you do everything? You're the CEO. You're the mom. You're playing tennis. You you're actually yes. <laughs> have a work-life balance. How do you do all that? And what's some, some tips for people for managing their time? Okay. Well, the, the key is that first – First and foremost, my husband and I are on the exact same page. You know, we kind of have this team trivia, and part of it is our home life and part of it is our company, and we both yeah. work on both of those parts. Mm -hmm. And just like in the company, we have help at home, right? So so we have a, a house cleaner and a, and, a, and, a, and a landscaper and a pool person, right? And just like in our company, we have, you know, our profit center managers, our tech guys, our, our art per people, you know what I mean? So the biggest thing is not thinking you have to do it all. Yeah. The biggest thing is That's having the a support staff. We don't and think about that what, sometimes. You're right. What that does, does it make sense for me to go out and mow the lawn? It just doesn't make sense, right? And so, it's one, somebody could do it so much better than me. Two, they could do it much faster than me. Three, I, it's not something I enjoy. Right. You know what I mean? So, make sure you're doing what you are good at and not the other things. Yeah. You know, I say you've got to ditch or delegate or delegate or duplicate. Right. So for the things that I am good at, then I've got to find somebody else who is just as good. Right. Yeah. I start to duplicate. If I'm not good at it, then I delegate it or I think about it. Do I really need to do it? Do I does it need to be done at all? Yeah. And the biggest thing is being busy and being productive are two different things. 
I mean, I plan out my days and you're right. I mean, I play tennis three to four times a week, but I get up early. I start my day and my day is pretty much mapped out. Yeah. You know, it doesn't always go as planned, but most of the time it does because it's mapped out. What time so do you get happens, up typically? Um, mm -hmm. Around 530. That's good. Yes. And, you know, and I always either I'm either at the gym or I'm playing tennis. Wow. You know, I mean, at first I get up, I kind of do my writing and then I go to the gym or the tennis mm -hmm. and I never, ever check those emails in the morning. Right. That's just a waste of your great, you know, fresh time. Yeah. But most people get up and they look at their email. Then they get caught up on Facebook and they get caught up in all these things. You're right. You're right. right? You're right. right. That time I get up and I go, you know, before the kids get up, before my husband gets up, I just get my stuff. Yeah. Because it's, it's a big difference when you're working out of your home compared to, you know, in an office. Yeah. You know, you, gotta, you have to set up boundaries. Yeah. And that's what I do with my kids and you know, my family, you know. Yeah. Marilyn, I want to be the first one to thank you so much. Everyone should go to workingmomsonly.com. Check out Reinventing the Entrepreneur, and I'll link up your the Marilyn Tribby site too. And it's been a true honor. So thank you very much, Marilyn. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome.